Hi, I'm Tony Hill. And I'm Jonathan Scott. And you're watching Sports Plus Chicago. This weekend, the Bears took on the Carolina Panthers up in Carolina. As a result, it was a 31-24 loss to the Panthers. The Bears, a team that looks really good on paper when they're healthy, are really struggling. They had difficulties turning over the ball. They had difficulties executing on offense. And the defense most certainly is not getting the turnovers that they're, they're accustomed to. Now, Jonathan, my partner here, you're playing the Bears. You're watching this team, and, and, you, and you look at this team. What would you prepare? What would you set yourself up to play against the Bears? you got to remember, here's a team that's got so many injuries on their ball club. You don't know who's coming and who's going. How would you prepare for the Bears? Well, uh, being that they have Atlanta coming up, if I was Atlanta, I would go in trying to get Chicago to turn the ball over. Right now, Chicago is 29th in the league in turnovers. <laughs> so 29th? When you're, when you're 29th in the league in turnovers, uh, a lot of the bad things are happening on the offensive side of the ball. Now, go ahead and say it. You lose when you're 29. <laughs> when you you're 29 turnovers, you, you lose. You lose ball games you know, when, you, yeah, yeah. when you turn the ball over. Yes, yes. Yeah, so the thing about what Atlanta, well, what, what Chicago has to do better is that they have to minimize turnovers, bottom line. And that comes from execution, knowing where and where to, where to be and how to get there. Uh, I think uh, that's just the struggles that's going on with Chicago. Excellent ball club. I mean, they got amazing firepower on the offensive side of the ball. And unfortunately, dealing with so many injuries, like you said, it just causes, it just causes a lot of frustration. I think what they have to do is sit back, really focus on what they're good at, and make that the strong part of their game plan. Now, when you talk about the Chicago Bears, obviously what has hampered them all season long has been turnovers. Uh, you and I had a chance to talk off camera. One of the things we're talking about, we're talking about Jay Cutler. Here's a guy, he throws the interception, it seems to be tragic. I mean, poor take and fumble, the team recovers, but when Jay Cutler throws the interception, it always seems to be some type of catastrophe that occurs behind his turnovers. Yeah. I mean, is, is it Jay Cutler or is, you know, I mean, it was at Denver, it was at, <laughs> you know, wherever he goes, he always has this, you know, catastrophe type of situation. How would you assess this? Well, I think what it is is that um, that the Bears put a lot of emphasis on Cutler. He's probably the most proficient quarterbacks in the league when he is, when, like, when he's on his A game. I mean, he does things amazing. He can, he can pinpoint balls 50 yards down the field with beautiful accuracy. But I think what it is is that when everything is put on him, Thing, and if something goes wrong, it just kind of falls to pieces. And a lot of that has to do, and I have to say it, is that the offensive line has to ha allow him to be able to follow through on his throw. There was many times, Cutler makes great passes, even when he has a, li he has a D line or the offensive line in his face. I think they have to put more focus on one, getting the ball out quicker, and one, putting emphasis on how to pick up different stunts. Another thing you have to look at too, is that Carolina is a defense known for stunts, pick stunts, games on the on the defensive front. And I saw I saw the, the, the Bears offensive line struggle a bit. Well Cooley's a beast at linebacker for Carolina. There's no question about that. Coming from Boston College, this kid can play. He, he, I mean, he pressures the quarterback, he stops the run, he does an outstanding job. And when you look at Chicago, really their deficiency deficiency does lie on the offensive line. But when you got receivers like Brandon Marshall, Alshon Jeffries, uh, you got Martellus Bennett. We're talking about receivers. All three of these guys are 6'3 and above. Uh, and, and, and then you got a running back like Matt Forte. You know, I look at get color maybe these three step drops, get the ball in these guys' hands and let them make something happen. But when you look at the statistics this time, you know, Alshon had a great game. He had six catches for like 90 some yards and a touchdown. But uh, when you look at the rest of them, Forte is your leading, wide re leading receiver with 12 catches in a game. Something's wrong. Now, that's not bad. I mean, it's great to have a running back who can catch the ball coming out the backfield, but your players, and there's no question about it, is Brandon Marshall. Your players is Alshon Jeffries. Your players is Martellus Bennett when you're throwing the ball downfield. They've got to find a way. They've got to get that offensive line in gear mm -hmm. to be able to find a way to throw that ball downfield and get Matt Forte off that 3.6 yards per carry of running the ball because this guy's a runner. I mean, I like this guy. I compared him to one of the tops in the NFL. When I say one of the top, he's one of my top five running backs, and that's pretty good considering all the backs out there. Mm -hmm. But 3.6 yards of carry is not going to cut it for them. It's definitely not going to cut it. And you've got to also look at 
their division. They're in the they're in the NFC North, and boy, they have, they they got to go against some good defensive lines. And I mean, they got Detroit coming up twice. They have to uh, they have to come up with the Vikings, and then on top of that is. It, it, it's not easy to win in the NFC North, and especially with just the, the, the talent pool that's out there. Um, I, I really believe that they have to really redefine what they can do better on offense. <laughs> and like you said, if they're checking down to Forte 12 times a game, uh, you know, the defense, just ha they have, they, they're locked in to what they're going to do, and it, it becomes predictable. And it's hard to win games when the defense knows exactly what you're going to do. Well, let's talk about the defense. I mean, you've got a coach who's from Canada. I mean, I mean, the last part of his resume is out mm -hmm. of Canada. And this is where it's a wide open offense, and you've got to be able to throw multiple defenses out there to, mm -hmm. to kind of perhaps slow teams down in the Canadian Football League. Mm -hmm. But now we're playing in the NFL, and now, you know, we've got a team that's, that comes from a history of having, you know, Dick Buckus over there, Mike Singletary, you know, Richard Dent. You know, I mean, these mm -hmm. big boys on the line. What is happening to the Chicago Bears defense that used to be that mighty, awesome defense that, that made people just cream, you know, I mean, just squinch in their skin. Cringe, yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, cringe. That, that might be the word I'm looking <laughs> yeah, for. Yeah, exactly. But, you know, and, and I want to make sure, go on record, as a Cowboy, I never cringed uh, when we played the Chicago <laughs> Bears, although they did whip us pretty good one time, you yeah. know, uh, with Mike Dick back at the helm. But that's neither here nor there. Let's stay focused. Yeah. <laughs> Tell me about the defense. What's happening with the defense? Well, uh, I think... What it really boils down to is that Briggs is the leader of that defense, hands down. And I think he, he has so many familiar, unfamiliar faces. I mean, if you look at that defense, I mean, only person that he's worked with from numerous years would, would be Peanut Tillman, and he's out. You know? So I think, uh, I think he's got a lot on his back. And Briggs is naturally a weak side linebacker. And but he's in a position where he has to make all the calls, and it's kind of hard to make that, that call from a weak side position. Uh, I just think that they're at a position, I mean, in a point where... Uh, big you know, big transition, is, a, a transitional just, stage. Exactly. I mean, you look at a team, you know, you can't tell you, can't tell you, you're talking about, here's a guy who's making great hits, as a matter of fact, contributing this year, making really big plays, really solid, has been in the league for a while, mm -hmm. but he's hurt again. You know, yeah. and this is that your strong safety guy. You know, yeah. strong safety is that kind of guy who anchors that secondary. I mean, you, uh, you know, with Peanut Tillman being out, you know, a guy who who's going to be huge for him and another tricep, I believe, injury that's kind of taking him out. That creates a lot of problems for this team. Uh, and, and the defensive line are, it has not produced as, as what they would like. And so we're talking about linebackers really have to play a huge role. And Briggs, without a question, is a stud. But do you think it's not – when you have so many changes out there, I got to think that perhaps you got to conform in terms of your defensive philosophy, in terms of, you know, do you run the 3-4, do you go to the 4-3 because of all the injuries, mm -hmm. do you come into a 5-2, bring the linebackers up on the edge so they can create more problems on the line uh, and give the cornerbacks a better chance to cover. I mean, those are some of the things that I think that I'd like to see in adjustments for the Chicago Bears. Yeah, well, I think at this point, where they are now with the injuries, I think they just have to have a philosophy of bending, but don't break. <laughs> <laughs> just bend, but don't break. And allow the offense to be in a position to score points because that's what they do best. You put it in Cutler's hands, allow him to make accurate throws, they, win, they can win ball games. Well, to summarize this game, number one, the Bears have got to get the offensive moving. Cutler's got to eliminate turnovers. Forte's got to handle the ball. And, and They've got to get big yards downfield. On defense, without a question, they've got to improve. They've got to get guys moving on defense. They've got to get Briggs. Well, Briggs is already doing his thing. But they've got to get that defensive line and the nose tackle to be able to create some havoc in that middle to eliminate all those kind of runs. With that being said, we'll be right back with more Sports Plus. Sports Plus is brought to you by Bettenhausen Automotive. It's better at Bettenhausen. Tis the season to be scared, and I know one thing about you that we have in common. We love scary movies. Yes, we do. And, you know, we went down to Fantastic Fest, and we saw a whole bunch of things that make oh, yes. go bump in the right, night. Right, exactly. <laughs> However, this one was not there. This one is coming into theaters this Friday and on demand, and I know you're going to like this one. It's called The Houses October Built. 
And it's about a crew of people who do a sort of found footage documentary thing. That's crazy. Where they go around to all these haunted houses to try and find a legitimate scare. Right. And there's a lot of people who do that. My parents have that background. They love to do that whole thing. I mean, it's like they go on these, these adventures. And I'm like, I, I did it one time. I was like, okay, I'm done. Like, it's too creepy. I can't do it. <laughs> have you found a, a truly haunted house that really scares you? I mean, there's one that I, in the colony, that actually, it was called the Crider House. And for years, it was, you know, people would stay there every Halloween, and they get their freak, you know, they freak out. Um, and then they closed that whole road down. So it burnt down, and they closed the whole road down. So, I mean, there's probably sort of, some sort of legend behind that. I need to look into it more. All right, that sounds good to me. Well, I got to talk to the crew that's involved in this, and I can't say what happened to them, good or bad. Right. However... They're all from Dallas, which is really, really cool. That's they now cool. live in L.A., and they're doing their thing out there. But this movie is going to give you a little, little bit of a creepy feeling. So let's check out The Houses October Built. Congratulations on this film. This is so much fun, and what a perfect timing for Halloween. And people are going to haunted houses right now, and this Friday they actually get to see it. Were you guys big fans of going to haunted houses yourself growing up? Was that sort of the, the start of this? I think we all were, but but yeah. Brandy, that's why we cast yeah. her. <laughs> if she had been too big a fan, then we wouldn't have gotten the scares we needed. I know you went to a lot of locations in Texas. I know some people are gonna ask, are, are these places for real? Absolutely. Yeah, that was very important to us, is yeah. we wanted people to be able to go on a ride, um, even after watching the movie. So to separate ourselves from a lot of the other movies that, that fall under this, this genre, is we wanted to use as many real people in real places as we could. So all the scare actors are real, all these places are real, there's a list of them in the credits. So, you know, when you're done, you can go on and basically you can, you can meet some of the same characters we did if, if you want. We wanted audiences to question, wait, is this real, is this not real? And, you know, people have computers in their phones, so they'll walk out of the movie and go, come on guys, and Google these places and then go, wait a second, this actually exists. Uh, were there some places that were truly scary to you? I was scared Brandy. everywhere. <laughs> I was scared at every single place. So it's a genuine scream. So. Yes, yeah. So um, almost too much. You know, it's the way I was describing it earlier. Is that for me? It's like a it's like a workout. I really come out because I'm I'm scared every single time. So that I, if I, I walk out of that hunt, I'm like like breathing heavy, like just like can't can't do it. So, but yeah, they were all actually really scary to me. I don't know about these guys. Yeah, but. Some the scare actors were, some of them were very, very method. And they didn't break character. And you, call, you yell cut, they still didn't break character. So that's when it starts to get a little real. And every house has their own way of doing things or whatever, you know, each one at different themes or whatever, and different things work for different people. You know, Brandy can be scared by a pin drop, you know, but other people it takes a little bit more. Some people are more into the sets and just the realism of a body laying across a table or whatever other people, you know, um, whether it's clowns, you know, which is a big theme in our movie or sadistic doctors, everything is different at each haunt. And so there's something for, for everybody. Some things don't work for people, some things do. But they take a lot of pride in what they do too and really stick to their themes. So it's always fun to see what, what house does what. Yeah, well, and we're so happy to have you back here in Dallas. This has got to be cool. I know you're making the rounds, but to, to get to come back home, what do you get to do while you're here? We yes. get to do this. <laughs> yes. yeah. We're actually, we've, we've taken an RV from LA and for our kind of press tour and are hitting haunts along the way and having fun with that and getting the word in about the movie. But we're also going to be loading up in the RV in a couple days and driving to the Telluride Horror Show where that's where we're going to premiere The Hell's October Belt. So uh, we're kind of living out the movie ourselves again. We may, uh, we may stop by uh, Plano Senior High because I think it's a, it's a different, all four of us went to the same high school, which mm -hmm. I, I think is kind of a rarity in movies or, or whatever company you may have. Um, and so that kind of camaraderie and still being friends after so long. I'm uh, faking it. Yeah. I'm not really their friends. <laughs> but it's, it's a, I just think it's a, it, you know, it's just kind of a different rare case and hopefully that bleeds on the screen, the chemistry, so. So what do you think is the one moment or scene that, that will stand out to you when people ask you about this years from now? Oh, that was pretty fun to work on, right? What, what is the moment that you go, oh, I, I'm never gonna forget this? You know, it's different though, because when I've screened it with different people, different things work. Like I was talking about the haunted houses, I'll see somebody get scared and I'm like, that did it for you. And maybe it's, I, I wouldn't think that that would work. And other ones I'm like, oh, watch, watch, they're gonna be scared on this. And then that one doesn't work for them, but it works. It just, it depends on who the people are and what actually works for them. And there's a lot of great scenes in there. And uh, I think the realism 
um, is one of the biggest scares throughout the whole movie that is just creepy on a lot of the stuff that goes on at these haunts and how some of the workers are and taking it too far maybe. So I think that's a big character in itself of, uh, of creating scares. Well, everybody has a different phobia, you know, and it, whether you're afraid of clowns or spiders or, um, but I think being surrounded by a hundred scare actors in costume as we were in the RV, that sticks out to me because it's just, that's just not okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, since tis the season for Halloween, what are your favorite scary movies? I like the first half of it. I have to just say the first half because the first half is probably one of the scariest things I've ever seen. And it was on television, if, you know, it wasn't even at the theaters and to go to those links back, I don't know, probably 15 years ago, I was tough. I, you know, the, the second half, I just never even count. I only own the first half <laughs> DVD. It's two DVDs, I just threw away the second half. Mine's The Shining. Uh, yeah. I read The Shining in sixth grade. It was the first kind of horror book and, and my first introduction to Stephen King. And then to watch that movie and kind of see what I had read and what was in my head and then to have it play out, that was terrifying. Uh, Candyman. <laughs> say it three times. Yeah, don't no, say it too many times. Because I think for That's me one. it was more, it's scary, but then it was another thing, you know, because I watch it when having girls and we're sleeping over and it was kind of a dare. You would be like, okay, now go to the bathroom and see if you do it. And some people do it. And see if you can do would, what? No, <laughs> not saying it. Uh, I was, yeah, The Shining for sure. Um, anything re involving religion and possession has always been a big thing for me. The Omen, Stigmata, that one really screws with me for some reason. Um, Pet Cemetery is great. It's a really one that you should revisit if you haven't seen it in a while. That one really gets you. And The Ring scared the hell out of me. Went to see that by myself so he in a theater. I love horror. Yeah. Right? <laughs> now, not to ruin anything, but not everyone makes it out okay, as maybe they shouldn't. But do you see this could be uh, some sort of franchise? People could be going to different haunted houses. Well, I think the, the haunt world is the, the the haunt universe is so huge, and and now even more so, um, we, we got a call. Some of the guys helping out building some in the UK, building out in South America. Um, so it was, it's funny because Halloween is a, it's a English holiday first and we've kind of commercialized it. Now the rest of the world is kind of following suit. Um, and it's, it's so big. I mean, 30 million just Americans go alone a year. Um, so what we'd like to do is we definitely, we'd like, we tried to lay the tracks for a mythology. And some of it's very small detail, but there's a lot out there that, um, you know, the, the blue skeletons out there in this world, they do exist. and and. As society goes into every Halloween, they're going to want more and more extreme things to happen. Um, and, and with that, I think we have more of a story to tell. I just hope we don't keep losing cast members, because we started <laughs> at five and now we're at four, as you can see, so. Well, it's definitely creepy. It definitely gets to you, and I think people are going to love this. So congratulations again on the film. Thank, Thank you. you so much. What do you think? Whoa, that's creepy. <laughs> that's awesome. You just wait. I can't wait to see you in the theater. You're going to jump. No, you're going to have to hold me. Are you jumpy? A little bit, yeah. A little bit? A little bit. All right. Well, next we're going to discuss more movies, but first, boo! Ah, I didn't get her. I knew that was coming, because I knew that was coming. But if you knew it was coming? It, yeah, it's so scary. <laughs> I love it. Well, stay tuned for more on Sports Plus next. Hi, this is Paul Selfin for Sports Plus, and I'm here at Bettenhausen Fiat in Tenley Park taking a look at the brand new 2014 Fiat 500L. We've got a 1.4 liter turbo engine with a six speed Euro twin clutch transmission, and that'll get you 27 miles per gallon, 24 in the city, 33 on the highway. This Fiat comes equipped with 16 inch aluminum wheels, bi function halogen projector headlamps, daytime running headlamps, heated power mirrors with spotter mirrors deep tent sunscreen glass, and there's some really cool options for you, including a Bluetooth voice system with Sirius XM satellite radio, GPS navigation, park view rear backup camera. Now check out this interior. We've got the all important media hub, which has a USB. We got steering wheel mounted audio controls, black cloth, low back bucket seats. Here's what makes the L really cool. It's got four doors, which gives you easy access to a spacious back seat. And that is the 2014 Fiat 500L. And you know where you can get it, at Bettenhausen. Because remember, 
It's always better at Bettenhausen. Well, I know you're always looking for good suggestions for the movies, so I've got one more for you this okay. week. It's a movie called The Maze Runner. Have you heard about this one? I've seen the clips. Good, yeah. It's pretty intense. Now, this is one of those young adult novels that got turned into a film, and it's part of a trilogy that's coming out. And these kids uh, show up in this place where there's a giant maze, and they have to figure out every day how to get out of it, and they can't do it, and they have to... Now, they have to work together rather than against each other. So unlike the Hunger Games where they're trying mm -hmm. to kill each other, <laughs> here they're trying to work together to find a way out of it. And it's really intense. The monsters are really scary. And it's, it's a whole lot of fun to watch. And so I got to talk to the three young stars of the film. So we're going to take a look at that clip and see if this looks like one that you want to see. We only have three rules. First, do your part. Second, never harm another glader. Most importantly, never go beyond those walls. Well, this is so much fun, and it's it uh, it pulls no punches. I mean, it's it's uh, intense. So th this had to have been kind of fun to work on, right? Hugely, man. You know, um, I think uh, in many ways the experience of of working on it kind of parallel what was going on on set. I mean, it's strange because. Uh, you know, I, I, I obviously play uh, a slightly kind of less likable character, but, you know, we all were incredibly close and felt a genuine bond when it came to shooting this movie. And that kind of translates onto screen, you know, in terms of how close the characters all seem to be. I think you really get a sense that they were all living there. And then, yeah, when it came to the, to the action and, um, you know, the uh, adventure side of things, you know, that was just, that was just a blast. Yeah, it's, that's the, I, I remember being on set one day and going, this is what I dreamed of as a little mm -hmm. girl. I'm mm -hmm. in a movie. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm making a movie. And there's something about that word, and, and it just felt like that in, mm -hmm. on that set in the middle of the Glade. And mm -hmm. I was just like, don't mess it up, don't right, mess it up. Right, right, right. <laughs> the first time I saw the Glade, I was just like this. Man, when I was 10 years ago, if mm -hmm. I was 12, I would have thought that this was the coolest thing in the world, like just to watch as a fan, mm -hmm. like a movie. Mm -hmm. And when we did that, the wrestling scene too, for me, for some reason, that specifically, I just feel like if yeah. I was flipping channels as a 10 year old, I'd be like, what is this? And I think it was so cool, and that's just <laughs> what's so cool. What is it? <laughs> Who put us here? <laughs> what's out there? <laughs> but that's how you know that you're doing something great, is that your childhood self would be proud of you, right? Yeah. Yes, yes. That's totally. true. And right. it's, it's cool to just keep that in mind, you know? You don't want everyone to lose that. Like, it's mm -hmm. the reason we do this, you know? It all started there, yeah. um, loving it when we were that age. And, you know, you gotta think about that because that's such a cool thing. Yeah. yeah. Well, what do you suppose is the one moment, the day, the scene, the time on set that you think you'll always remember if someone asks you about this years from now? Mm. For me, it's always the, the, I mean, I love the movie. I'm really proud of the movie, um, but it didn't feel like we were making a movie to me. When I look back and I try and put myself in the feeling of a year ago, uh, it's the friendships that will stick with me. And it's, it's so difficult to explain because I know it sounds cheesy and I know it sounds like what every at cast say um, but I've, I've got best friends the rest of my life now yeah. um, and and it's nice to know that we all know exactly what it felt like to make this film yeah. and no one mm. else knows no yeah. one else will ever experience what we felt in those months and we know how it was tough and and we know how grueling it was and sometimes you can't say that you have to sit there and go oh, it was really great and yeah. fun yeah. but we all you know we experienced every side of it and there's something special about having that as our bond um, I mean yeah I, you know I'll never forget the entire experience, um, and I really, uh, you know, we, we've been saying this the whole time, like, we, we feel like everyone says this, but actually I don't think everyone says this, and I think for a reason, like, we truly believe, like, we truly do have friends for life, and, like, dear friends, all of us, like, I'm gonna cry seriously, again. like, and, and, you know, we're, we're, like, getting emotional in these interviews, it's amazing, because it's like the last day of press, so and we have to, like, go away from <laughs> each other cry. again, and, um, um, I'll, I'll, um, I'll never forget, uh, you know, again, everything about the film, but it's, 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 kind of um, most crazy to, to remember my first day in pre-production and going to the production office and feeling so nervous um, and, and you know, just not settled yet. And then, and then all my, all the first time I met everyone, you know, I like mm. have such a burnt memory of that every time. And, it, and it's so funny to look back because, because we hadn't known each other <laughs> yet. And it's incredible, it's incredible because like, you know, the first time I met Amel and Kaya and I came in like off a plane to audition with them and and I was like completely out of my mind, tired, didn't sleep, you know, in like two days. And, and like I came in and, and met them 
and and then the first time I met Will at the at the, you know, pre-production day, first time I, I met Keith. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Exactly. Exactly. First time I ran up to Thomas, I stopped. You know, Whoa. I stopped Thomas uh, after 20 minutes of stopping him and talking to him. I realized that he was on his way to the bathroom. <laughs> you know, little things like this that are literally just—it's such a trip, man. It literally makes me—it it does. It makes you know makes you emotional because we we have such we have such a connection and we're all just such a family. Yeah. Truthfully. Yeah. Well, that, you're all still young, but uh, we always like to ask everybody their Hail Mary moment, the moment where they just kind of had to go for it in their career, and it, and it worked out for them. So mm. what do you suppose that was for each of you? I've um, never heard that phrase before. Yeah, it's a nice one. Just got to go for it. Just gotta go in your career? It. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. Maybe I haven't even done it yet. I don't know. I think probably dropping my pants down around my ankles <laughs> next that's, to a that's highway. A <laughs> that's a go for it. <laughs> While wearing sort of like five pounds of prosthetic makeup. Um, <laughs> that was a sort of... Go get him, buddy. Moment. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. yeah. Made, made, you know, one of the times you're like, mum and dad are gonna be real proud, um, and that's why I'm doing this. <laughs> I can Go honestly him, say buddy. I've never heard that answer yeah. before. So. It's not in this movie, uh, <laughs> but uh, it got it cut. just you know, you said career, so I guess it got cut. Yeah. <laughs> not twice, please. <laughs> uh, <yeah. laughs> no, I was gonna spit. <laughs> I don't, is there any topping that? <laughs> no! <laughs> no, no, can we, let's just, yeah. yeah, yeah. Nice. Oh, <laughs> the very last thing, so why is it that people should go see this? I know so many people are excited about it, but there's a lot of competition in film out there. So what is it that, about this one that's just so cool that people are just gonna love about it? I, I, I think, just can't get the go get them, buddy. <laughs> I, I think we all feel uh, very proud of this um, because yeah. it is unique and I think it's been, you know, we're flattered by comparisons that have been made to, uh, other films uh, that seem to be part of this kind of trend of books being adapted into films, but this is going to surprise people, and uh, they should go see it because it's a truly unique experience, and they're going to feel part of it. You know, it's very immersive, and, and it's about togetherness and camaraderie, and very positive message as opposed to watching a bunch of kids kind of have to compete or, or you know, being forced into deathly circumstances. <laughs> yeah, I just I don't got know how. out with that. I don't know how you got and I'm sorry. That. I'm sorry. And I this shot myself in the foot. Uh, Hi, this is Paul Salfin for Sports Plus, and I'm here with the beautiful 2015 Fiat Abarth. This is the performance edition of the Fiat 500. This thing is quick. With a 1.4 liter, 1416 valve multi-air turbo engine, this heavy duty six speed automatic transmission will make sure you get there while still getting 27 miles per gallon. With 16 inch, six by five inch aluminum wheels, bi-function halogen projector headlamps, and in back, you'll find the dual bright exhaust tips. Check out these great performance cloth high back bucket seats. Black with red trim in the front and the back seats. The Abart features the Blue and Me hands-free communication as well as the Fiat premium audio system. Check out the leather wrapped shift knob as well as the steering wheel mounted audio controls. You want something cool? You want something fast? You can get it right here at Bettenhausen Fiat of Tenley Park. I'm Tony Hill. And this is my partner, Jonathan Scott. And make sure to follow us at Sports Plus Show on Facebook and Twitter. And we'll be back next week on Sports Plus. Sports Plus.